So chapter five, the nuclear atom. Um, this will be probably a two segment uh, video. First we have um, the chapter overview, which will be um, looking at radioactivity, what exactly is radioactivity. Then we'll talk about nuclear equations. We'll look at how we measure radi radiation. Then we'll talk about the math behind the half-life of radioisotope. Then we'll look at some applications, and then we'll finish out with fission and fusion. Um, so <clears throat> a lot of students always tell me they wish this chapter was earlier in the semester. Um, you're going to find it's sort of a breath of fresh air, if you will. Um, once you learn the three basic particles and you have those down, you'll find that nuclear equations for us um, is not that difficult. So for radioactivity then, what we understand about it is atomic structure came from studies of radioactive elements. So <clears throat> something like the horse before the cart, cart before the horse, the radiation um, was known about and calculations were done with radiation before we even knew the three basic particles of the atom. So before we knew what protons, electrons, and neutrons were, we understood a little bit about radioactivity. So radioactivity is the process by which atoms spontaneously emit high energy particles or rays from their nucleus. Um, and this was first observed in 1896 by Henry Becquerel. So if you flip back, I think it was chapter four, maybe when we looked at the atom, you'll see that a lot of the understanding of the atom came afterwards. We talked about alpha particles being used to determine um, atomic structure within the atom and defining the nucleus. So if you recall, we shot alpha particles, all right, in the gold foil experiment, we shot alpha particles at gold foil, gold atoms, and looked at how they changed in direction. And that's what led Rutherford into establishing the nucleus. So again, you know, five years, 10 years before that, first observed by Henry Becquerel. So which elements are going to be radioactive? Now you don't need to memorize this, but typically the easiest way to remember is everything after polinium. So P-O-A-T-R-N, and then everything after that, with one exception, which is technetium right in the center. So outside of that, all the rest are not radioactive. Now you got to be careful because some of them do have radioactive isotopes. So if you recall, we talked about isotopes, the difference in mass numbers. So if you need to go back to chapter four and take a look at that again, but there are radioactive isotopes for all the different elements. However, the ones that are found naturally as radioactive elements are listed here. Now there's natural and then there's also artificial radioactivity. We are not going to concern ourselves with the artificial. What we're going to look at are naturally radioactivity, radioactive elements. So isotopes that have been here since the Earth has formed, for instance, uranium. Produced by cosmic rays from the sun. So for an example, carbon-14. So if you remember, carbon had three isotopes, 12, 13, and 14. 14 is radioactive. Now there's also synthetic radioisotopes. And again, we're not gonna focus so much on this. These are usually made in, radio, in nuclear reactors. Um, if you've ever heard of cyclotrons or linear accelerators or the uh, collidri collidrion, which is the in the Swiss, in Switzerland. Um, these are where we're gonna take these particles, spin them around really fast, collide them into each other and make things that are either larger or use that momentum to break things apart. And again, we're not gonna focus on that. We're gonna be focusing on the naturally occurring radioactive at um, atoms and isotopes and as they apply to the medical field. So some common types of radioactive emission, alpha, beta, and gamma. These are our major forms of radioactive emission. And these are the ones we need to know. So if we know what an alpha particle is, if we know what a beta particle is, and we know what a gamma particle is, that's gonna be half our battle. So once we know what the particles are, we can look at how we use those in a radioactive equation. So these types of emissions are the most common and they're the ones most often used when developing analytical methods. So again, we're gonna look at each one. So major types of radioactive decay. First, we have alpha emission, then beta, then gamma. If I take these three particles and I throw them through a magnetic plate, charged plate, if you will, plus, minus, we're going to see as the particles go through, they separate. So beta goes towards the positive, right? So it's coming along here. It sees the positive charge. It says, hey, that's nice. I like that. And it ends up way up on top of the detecting screen. Alpha, just the opposite. Alpha is coming through and it sees the negative and starts to bend towards it. And so it drops to the bottom of our screen. 
whereas gamma goes straight through. And that probably gives you a little insight into what type of particles we have here. So beta is going to be a negatively charged uh, species particle, right? And we know that because it's attracted to that positive plate. The alpha must be positive because it's attracted to that negatively charged plate. And last but not least, we have gamma. Gamma flows right on through, so if you're thinking it's neutral, you are correct. All right, now how do these three particles play into nuclear equations? So nuclear equations show how atoms decay. Now they're similar to our chemical equations, but we're still going to have a little bit of a change here. If you remember, back in chapters 6 and 7, we couldn't create new matter. We couldn't destroy matter. That kind of falls apart when we look at nuclear equations. Now, what's going to happen here is, is that the charge and the mass have to balance. So we can't just create or destroy mass, and we can't create or destroy charge, but we can convert them from one to the other and back and forth. So it's going to differ from a chemical equation because now the element can change into other elements. That's the charge balancing component. So you have to keep track of the type of isotope. So for our nuclear equations, we'll base them on type. Remember, there's three types of emitters we're going to be looking at, alpha, beta, and gamma. So your general format is going to be your radioactive nucleus is going to somehow emit or give off, or maybe we have to slam it with a different particle, but it's going to form some new nucleus and then that radiation that comes off. So for instance, if we have alpha radiation, then what we're going to do is we're going to show that radium-226 can undergo alpha emission. So there's our radon, 22688. Okay, it's going to make some new nucleus and an alpha particle because it's an alpha emission. Helium-42 is that alpha particle. So whenever we see alpha emission, the 42 helium has to be one of our products. Okay, so alpha emission will always have a helium-4-2. Now the key is we have to figure out what the question mark is to complete the equation. So the first thing we're going to do is look at the mass and then the charge. So over here we have protons, 88. Total mass is 226. On the opposite side, we're going to have 88 because we know that can't change. But now we've lost two protons to the helium. So that means our new nucleus is going to have 86 protons. For the total mass, we know it was 226 minus the 4 for the helium gives us 222. So our new particle then is going to have a mass of 222 and 86 protons. So we'll go to our periodic table and we see that's radon. All right, what about beta emission? Well, beta emission is very similar to alpha emission, except we have a different particle. We have a beta particle. So cobalt-60 will undergo beta emission. So we'll start with cobalt-60, and it turns out that a beta particle is an electron. Now, hopefully that made sense. The alpha particle had two protons in it, and it was attracted to the negative plate. The beta particle has an electron in it, and it's attracted to the positive plate. So now, this will mess with our math a little bit, but if you just do the math straight and kind of not pay attention to the signs too, too much, you won't get lost or confused. And again, you don't have to worry about how this does it or why it does it. You only have to understand that when we have beta emission, it's releasing an electron. You're going to do these mathematical steps and you're going to produce the new equation. So again, we have 27 protons, total mass of 60. On the product side, we now have 27 protons, but we also have an electron. So that's going to be minus a negative 1. That's going to give us 28 protons in our new nucleus. For the total mass, it's not going to change because the mass of an electron is 0. That means we have nickel 60, 28. It's going to be our new nucleus. So cobalt 60 through beta emission will become nickel 60 and of course we'll lose that beta particle, we'll lose that electron. All right, last but not least, gamma radiation. Now remember the gamma particle now is going to be in the product, and the gamma wasn't attracted to anything. So here we're going to take technetium, 99M43, 
is the atomic number, it's going to make some new nucleus plus a gamma particle. So alpha particle was a helium-4-2, beta was an electron, 0, minus 1, and now we see gamma is going to be 0, 0. And that means it's just energy. The math, of course, will be simple. You're adding and subtracting zeros. So it's going to look exactly the same, which means it's still technetium. But look what's happened to our mass number. Up top, it's 99m. That's the beginning. It means metastable. And then on the bottom, we got rid of the m. We're saying it already emitted that gamma, and so now it's stable. So those are our three types of emissions. Other than that, we can bombard things with particles, but you'll be told what those particles are. And you're going to follow the same math components, where we just simply add the pieces together, come up with the new nucleus, use your periodic table, and just don't worry about looking at mass numbers. Just trust the math for the mass numbers, just as we did when we talked about isotopes. So it's the same type of thing. Now, why do atoms decay? Well, some nuclear arrangements are just less stable than others. And we don't need to make a list of knowing which ones are stable and which ones are not. Basically, I'm going to say this atom will undergo alpha emission. State the equation. All right, so I'm going to tell you what the particle is. I'm going to tell you what the atom you're starting with is. You just have to calculate what the new nuclei is going to be. Do not overthink this. I'm not going to give you anything crazy. I already told you we're not going to do artificial. Right? We're only doing natural, which are those three emissions we just saw. Now, we will do nucleus bombardment, so we'll hit it with a neutron. Again, I'll give you that type of particle. You'll see some of those in the homework set and the practice set. I shouldn't call it a homework set. There is no homework. It's a practice set. You'll see those in the practice set so that you can practice them. We even see some nuclei will undergo two changes. So to start, then it have its first change, then something will happen and it have its second change, back to back. Right, so it might be an alpha emission followed by a gamma, or an alpha emission followed by a beta, or a beta, then an alpha. So as long as you know what the alpha particle is, the beta particle is, and the gamma particle is, you should be good to go with the rest of these. Any other particles, I will give you in the equation itself. Now the radioactive isotope decays to form a more stable nucleus. Now why does it decay? Well, if it's mass, it's, it's going to get rid of an alpha particle. It's going to emit an alpha particle. If it's charge that it needs to balance, then it's going to release a beta particle. And last but not least, if it's just holding on to energy, then it's going to release a gamma particle. And again, we're not going to worry about necessarily figuring out the why or which ones do what, right? You're going to be simply asked to balance nuclear equations. I will give you the particles or tell you the type of emission it is, and then you will simply calculate the isotope that's new. Now, there are going to be other ways to do these things, but they're not seen in nature. So again, we're focusing just on what is naturally occurring. Now, how do we measure the activity? So the first units we look at are DPS, disintegrations per second. And of course, we can change the time on that. We can look at DPM and do disintegrations per minute. Then there's the Curie. So you may have heard of Madame Curie. She did a lot of work with radioactivity. And so she's been given a unit here, and that unit is 3.7 times 10 to the 10 dps. That's a lot of disintegrations per second. right? Divide by 60 and you can get disintegrations per minute. Now the accepted unit, the SI unit, is the Becquerel, named after, as we saw, Henry Becquerel who first observed radiation. Now he refers to it as an event per second. right? Instead of saying disintegration, it's an event. So it could be a disintegration or it could be just a collision. And that way, we're not locked into any type of specific type of radiation. It's just an event per second. Now, one Becquerel is equal to one DPS because that disintegration per second would be an event. And so events per second then would be Becquerels. Now, we commonly will use micro or milli curies in radioactive analytical studies. And realistically here for us, we're talking in the medical world. So if you were going to take the barium soda, it's going to be measured out in curies, either micro or millicuries, depending on the patient and the size. Okay, now the REM is the rad equivalent for man used to describe biological damage. This is really what we're concerned about when we get the word radioactivity in our mind. A lot of us, we hear radioactivity and we start thinking, oh no, it's bad for me, it's bad for me. Well, that's because we think about it as what kind of damage can it do to me? 
So what is a rad then? Well, a rad is the radiation absorbed dosage. Now, the reason why the rad becomes a little bit more important than say the DPS or the Becquerel or the Curie is because here it is taking into account the type of radiation. So as we're going to see, and as you probably imagined, some radiations are worse for us than others. Some don't harm us at all, and others will burn you in an insta-second, right? So it just really depends on what type of radiation it is. Then how much, right? How many events per second? One event per second, maybe not so bad. 10 to the 10, that's a lot of disintegrations per second. That could be a lot worse for you. Right, so RADs and REMs, look at this. RADs, look at the radiation absorbed dosage. REMs is the biological damage that's gonna be done based upon the RAD. Now there's also rontogens. Whoa, the slide got a little messed up there. Rontogens are measuring the ions, the radiation that produces the X-ray or the gamma radiation. And of course the Curie is the amount of radioactive materials that produce that many disintegrations per second. Okay, so <clears throat> Again, the ones we're going to be focusing on for us will be RADs and REMs. RADs, radiation absorbed dosage, and the REM is that biological damage, how much is actually done. All right, so monitoring radiation then. There's many approaches to monitoring radiation. First, we look at the measurement of exposure, all right? Photographic imaging, computer imaging, maybe a Geiger counter. Right, so photographic imaging might be something like an ID badge. Computer imaging, something like a scanner. Geiger counter is like the little clicker machine when you watch the movies with like ET, right? Scintillation detectors, very similar to a Geiger counter. So what are you gonna be most familiar with? For most of us that are taking this course, we wanna go on to be in the medical professions. We're gonna be looking at film badges. So a film badge, is just something you wear on your person when you're in your job, doing your job with radiation, and it's gonna get exposed whenever you're exposed. And then what they're gonna do is collect that badge from you, and every once in a while they're gonna test it to see just how much exposure you've had. So it comes in various types based on the area you need to monitor. Now, these things can't be used back and forth, right? So typically film badges are good for like X-ray radiation or gamma radiation. So for those of you that wanna be x-ray techs, right? This is what you're going to wear for the majority of your career. You're going to wear a little badge on your person while you're administering x-rays to patients. After so many days, I don't know what the times are in the hospital, to be quite honest. Um, in the lab for us, it was months, but that's because we only worked with the x-ray diffractometer so many days per month. If we were in there every day, maybe they would have said, no, we need to check it every every week or whatever. Um, or if we're going to be in there hours per day, maybe they want to check it every day. But for us, it was monthly. Monthly, they would collect our badge, see how much exposure we've had. Knowing how much time we we're supposedly in the lab, they would make sure that we'd only gotten X amount of exposure over that time period. They'd replace our badge. So you'd have three badges kind of going at every, time, you know, every rotation, if you will. So um, there was always a couple badges you could grab from, but you always wanted to make sure you're using the same badge for the entire month. Turn that badge in get your new badge, put it on. If the old badge was still good, they'd put it back in the rotation. If not, we'd have to replace it. Now, radioactive decay. <clears throat> so that's how we monitor radiation. We said the type of radiation matters here, but we what we're really referring to is the decay itself, those events. So there's some high order math that goes into this, but we're gonna try to smooth that math out, make it as easy as possible for us to just understand the basics here. So the rate constant K is dependent on the specific radioactive species. So whenever we have a rate, a rate in chemistry is represented by the lowercase letter K. And what a rate is, is just simply saying, this is how long it takes, it's how fast it is, it's a speed. It is one significant characteristic of a radioactive isotope, right? So the higher the rate, the more decay. The more decay, the more harmful, I guess, is the best way to say that radioisotope will be. We commonly use a modified form of this constant called T1 half, or half-life. The time required for 50% of a specific radioisotope to decay, right? So a half-life then means that if I have one gram, or if you wanna think of this as 100 grams, how much time does it take before 50 grams has been used up in the radioactivity? And then half of that, 
would be the 25 grams. Then half of that, 12 and a half. Then six point, then three point, then as it approaches zero. Now depending on what that half-life is, that's gonna tell us how harmful it could be. So you don't have to memorize any of these. This will be part of the question as well. But carbon-14, for instance, has a half-life of 5,730 years. Sodium-24, on the other hand, is only 15 hours. Uranium-235, 704 million years. Okay, so that half-life is telling us how long it's going to take for half that material to decay. So if I have 100 grams of carbon-14, it's going to take 5,730 years before I'm down to half, 50 grams. Then it's going to take another 5,730 years before I'm down to 25 grams, so forth and so on. So the T1 half for nickel 63 is 100 years. If you had 100 grams of nickel 63, how much would remain after 250 years? Now there's an equation for this, so you can plug and chug. Now the questions you'll get on the exam, I'm going to ask them in a way that you could answer them either A, using the equation, or B, setting up a table. I'm going to show you both ways. So here's your equation. A is equal to A naught, so the amount of material is equal to the initial amount of material, times E raised to the negative 0 0.693 times T divided by T one half. So the amount of time, 250 years, divided by the T one half, 100 years. So we'll plug all that in. We have 100 grams of material. We're gonna multiply that by E raised to the power of negative 0 0.693 times 250 years divided by 100 years. Now your calculator will spit out 17.7 grams. So again, now you can have your calculator on the exam. If you have the big TI-80, there's probably a half-life calculation already set up. And you just simply fill in the blanks, hit execute, and it gives you the answer. If not, you can use a regular calculator. You can plug all these things in. As long as you have that natural log function on your calculator, you should be good to go. Now, what if you don't like this? You don't want to use that. You don't understand what E is. You don't want to do a natural log and blah. I just don't want to do it. Well, again, I said I'm going to show you how you can make a table. So the amount remaining for nickel 63 would go something like this. I'm going to look at the number of half-lives. I'm going to look at the amount of material that's left and how much time has gone by. So our initial half, half-life, we've had zero half-lives. We're going to start with 100 grams and no time has gone by. Now we were told the half-life was 100 years. So after 100 years, we're going to down half of the material, 50 grams, and that's going to be one half life. After another 100 years, we're going to cut that in half. We're down to 25 grams, and now we've had two half lives, so forth and so on. So we could do the next one if we wanted. We could say after 500 years, we're going to be down to 3.125 grams, and that's going to be five half lives. After 600 years, that's going to be what 1.5, actually 1.625, something along those lines. And then six. Now remember, our question was 250, and so it falls right in between these two. Now that makes it a little difficult because we're not at 25 and we're not at 12 and a half. And realistically, the math is logarithmic. So if we've done two and a half, then really we're like somewhere here in the curve. If we were at three, it would be 12 and a half. And if we were at two, it would be 25. But we're somewhere in here and unfortunately it's a curve. So it's not quite just take half of that, but that's what we're gonna do. So if I take half of that, 12 and a half, and we take half of that half, that gives us six and a quarter. So I'm going to add these two together. I'm going to take, well, we're going to think about subtraction. I'm at two, and now I want to take away halfway to being there. Is that seven? Twenty-five. 
25 minus 6.25, 18.75. So using our quick little table method here, we've got 18.75. And of course, the answer was 17.7. .7. So we're off by less than a gram, but we didn't have to know how to use the natural log. Now, if Mr. Caro, who controls what the test questions will be, writes the test question so that you're going a whole number for your half-life, then guess what happens? Whether you use the equation or whether you make a table, you come out to the same answer. And so that's exactly what I'm going to do. When I write the questions, I'm going to make sure that the question is on a whole number of the half-life. So either you have two half-lives, three half-lives, four half-lives. And that way, whether you use the table or whether you use your calculator, you arrive at the same answer. So again, if you have a TI-80, 82, 83, and you have that equation already plugged into your calculator, and it it's just a matter of plugging and chugging for answers for you, then feel free to use your calculator. If you don't have a natural log on your calculator, do not run out to buy a calculator. You can simply make the table to get your answer. Now, the next thing we want to talk about then is the radiation exposure and safety. And we're going to push that off to segment two. So we're going to stop here and then we'll get into the radiation and safety exposures, shielding, looking at syndromes and the REMS, things like that, that will all be in the second uh, sec segment. So that's it for our math. There is no more math in the nuclear equations. All we'll be looking at is the nuclear equations and the half lives for, lives for the math. Everything else would be conceptual. So stay tuned for segment two. Talk to you soon.